so are we good? Um, we're good? Okay. Man, you guys got really quiet. All right, hey. Well, good morning, everyone. My name's Felix. Uh, Quinona is one of the pastors here. Uh, obviously, I'm not Matt, just a little bit taller, uh, a lot less good looking. So I um, want to have an opportunity, obviously, just to share the word uh, with all of us today. But before we do that, let's just bow our heads, pray, ask the Lord to, to lead us and, and guide our time. Jesus, we worship you as our Savior and as our Lord and God this morning. Lord, as, as we gather here in this place, Jesus, we, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us, Lord. Illuminate your word to us, Father. Bring conviction to our hearts. Uh, be our comforter. Be our counselor. Guide us, Lord, as we strive to be more like Christ, Lord God. Not on our own strength, certainly, but, Lord, with your grace, your mercy, uh, empower us, embolden us, Father, as we share time together today in your word as brothers in the Lord God. May we walk out of this place, Lord, again, just reflecting uh, on your goodness, your grace, and the power uh, of the gospel, Lord Jesus. And, and Lord, may we walk, walk out change, Father, ready to take on our day, Lord, whatever that may mean, whether in our, in our work, Lord, in our home, with our families, Lord, with anyone that we may encounter, Lord, may there the power, the love, the goodness of God be experienced because you are working in and through our lives, God. I thank you for every man here, uh, every home that's represented, every family, Lord, and just pray blessing, favor, ask Jesus that you would, uh, again, enable us, Father, to, uh, to walk closely with you, Lord, and to look more and more like Christ every single day, Lord. We love you, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen, amen. and amen. Again, my name is Felix. I've been here about a year and a half. Uh, I do have a Detroit hat on. Uh, I lived in Detroit for about uh, almost 11 years. Three of my four kids were born there. I'm a huge Lions fan. Uh, I love the Lions even more because one of Dalton's own, J Jameer Gibbs, is a running back kid that graduated from Dalton High. And we're just praying that God would take him to the Super Bowl. No, okay, I, that might be a little too much. Um, so, so we're in, I want to hop right in, right? We're in the Gospel of John, uh, particularly in John chapter 5. Before we get to that, I want to just share a quick story uh, recently, um, I, I was here in a road um, in the Dalton Bypass on my way to pick up one of my kids, and lo and behold, you know, I'm, I'm talking to my mom on the car, you know, radio speaker thing on the phone, and uh, man, all of a sudden, like, I see a guy. I'm, I'm someone I tend to look in the rearview mirror a lot, just I've been in a couple accidents, unfortunately. So I'm, you know, on my P's and Q's just looking around, and there is this Jeep weaving in and out of traffic. Have you ever had this happen to you? Right. And in the moment, I'm seeing this guy. Right. And sometimes you can't just help but go, wow, that guy is bold. I mean, he's cutting in, weaving in front of trucks, doing all kind of things. And I was just saying, Lord, protect him. Jesus, help this guy. I don't know if he has to use the restroom. Maybe there's a family emergency. I don't know what is going on. And that was my prayer until he got up right behind me. <laughs> right. And he, I mean, there was nowhere to go. There's a, there's a two-lane road. There's a car to my right. I'm on the left lane. And he, I mean, gets as close as I feel like you can get to someone before hitting them. All of a sudden, my heart, my demeanor began to change because I wasn't praying, Lord, help him. It's like, Lord, if that guy hits me, we're going to have a problem here. <laughs> it changed a little bit, right? There was a little bit. It went from prayer for wisdom. God, it prayed... To, to all of a sudden a frustration, and I mean, he came on me so fast that I, you know, and maybe you are, have been in that position where we're making eye contact through the mirror, through the wind, he's looking, and, and me, and I'll be honest, in just a moment of weakness and frustration, I don't know if you guys have had this, I threw up a hand. What are you doing? Like, was my response, what are you doing? Now, I'm grateful to report, I did not close my hand, I did not point to Jesus with a finger, I didn't do any of that stuff. <laughs> But I did throw a hand up and said, what are you doing? And this man, I could see, was losing his mind. I mean, just yelling. And I mean, I'm, I could read lips from where I was. And he was not praying for me. I know that. Um, I thought, can you believe this guy? And, and so in prepping for what we're going to get ready to talk about here in John chapter 5, there was a, a conviction that happened once he passed me and he went. Um, that th there was something where I was praying and asking uh, for the authority of Jesus, right, Lord, protect us, be with us, help that man and his family. And all of a sudden, when there was a circumstance that now it was directly to me, I went from praying for the authority of Jesus and the goodness of Jesus to be with someone 
And he went from being my Lord to more being just some wise counsel that was saying, hey, take it easy, Felix. We're okay. And my prayers changed. And it was less about, it was more he was counseling me, giving me some advice about my heart, my attitudes, my actions, because now someone was stepping on my toes. And I wanted to, I share that story just to kind of set a little bit of the background of what we're going to get into here in John chapter 5. And today we're just talking about, you know, Jesus being Lord. And I want to make that statement that Jesus is Lord. I think, I, I, you know, if we were in service, we may get an amen. We may get, you know, certain ones of us that would say, absolutely, maybe you have a sure, you got a license plate, you got a sticker, you got a Bible, you got something that says Jesus is Lord, right? We're, we're Christ-following, God-fearing people here. There's not much pushback that we would get in that space, and yet I, I want to show what, Jesus, what happens when Jesus talks about that and then how that has to do with us, because I think maybe, perhaps if you're a little bit like me, that that statement doesn't step on your toes until it does, right? That all of a sudden when we see Jesus being Lord, I'm good when he's Lord in certain ways, and then I struggle when Jesus is Lord in other ways. And so we see, right, ultimately, um, you know, we see Jesus, his role, his authority here in John chapter 5. He's going to begin challenge, right, to be challenged, right? And, and as we've been going through the book of John, uh, there's an intro in chapter 1. I was here for Matt when he talked about, you know, obviously the first, you know, five verses of, of uh, John chapter 1 where he's laying out that he is the word made flesh, the word that dwelled amongst all the great things that talk about Jesus. And, and, and then there's the announcement of John the Baptist, and Jesus begins to call his first disciples. Then we see people being interested in Jesus, the miracle worker, right? Chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, there's an interest peaking, like who is this thing that this teacher is doing? How is he teaching the word? How is he speaking about who God is? What can he do for us? And we see you know, uh, Jesus turns water into wine, right? I'm sure for the people at that wedding, a favorite miracle of Jesus. Then Jesus clears the temple, and then there's the people that were zealous for God's word and going, man, the temple has become something that it wasn't, and they were clapping and cheering. And then Jesus meets, meets uh, Nic Nicodemus, right? Nick at night. He meet, meets with him. He talks with him, has a conversation, illuminating the teachers of Israel. Then Jesus, right, has this encounter with a Samaritan woman at a well, and, and he's breaking norms and traditions and showing the heart of God. And then an official comes to Jesus and, and Jesus heals his son. And so we see the goodness of Jesus, the Jesus we can all, uh, you know, root for, be encouraged by, see that Jesus is, is doing, you know, the, the work of God on behalf of his father. And so now we begin to see Jesus affirming who he is and people don't like it. All right. People don't like it, particularly religious leaders. Uh, it's easy to go after the religious leaders, um, and, and I'll, I'll talk about this here in just a moment, but I, more importantly, I think that there's a, a self-deceit de and, and that can easily find satisfaction and even purpose in knowing the truth, even though we're not living it, and this is where we find the Pharisees, and maybe this is where you find yourself, sometimes I know I've found myself, there's a comfort in knowing that I know who is Lord, I know where to put my faith, I've, you know, I'm 42 years old. You know, my mom got saved when I was six years old. I think I've shared it with this group before. I've been in church for 36 years of my life. Um, you know, I had the just uh, incredible just experience serving and following the Lord. And there's the danger of going, I know what is right, but knowing what is right is completely different than doing what is right. Right? Like that, that truth can be weakened of its power when it's tr like unlived truth. Right? And it's not to say that it's not the truth, that it doesn't stand, that we share the truth. Right, Obviously, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But the religious leaders, they had, there's a trust in tradition. There's what I know. There's what I grew up with. There's an understanding of the word. And even some superstition here in John chapter 5. But let, let's hop into it. Here's what it says in, in verse 1. It says, after this, uh, a Jewish festival took place. We don't know what festival because it doesn't say. Uh, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he went by the sheep gate in Jerusalem. And there was a pool called uh, Bethesda in Aramaic, which has five colonnades. With, uh, within these lay a large number of disabled, blind, lame, and paralyzed. So the healing and benevolence ministry was in this part of the temple, right? And so there was sick people, hurty, hurting people, needy people, all went to this one place. And so I, I'm, I'm not going to read, depending on what version of scripture you have, uh, of the Bible that you're reading, there's some added verses in there that talk about why they were sitting by this pool, and it, it talks about the water being stirred up. 
Um, it talks about whoever would get into the that an angel would come and stir the water, and whoever got into the water first, if you were sick or lame, that that person would be healed. Um, there's some debate about what all that means and if it's true, but again, this is not original to the oldest manuscript that was written. It is something that was added later, and it's believed to have been added by a scribe that was trying to give some context around what the belief was, but we'll see. You know, some folks have asked me before, do you really think an angel was? It's like, no, I, I think that's what they thought, but I don't think that's what was happening because Jesus doesn't acknowledge it. Uh, John doesn't make a reference to it. It is something that was added uh, uh, later. Um, it was believed in that day, but again, we don't think it's true. Um, also, too, just a couple things, right? If you're trying to process that, is that uh, Jesus, if it would have been an angel stirring the water, Jesus could have just helped the guy into the water, right? Then there's the practical part of just the understanding of the principle that God is sending an angel to stir water and is making lame people race to the pool. That seems a little cruel, right? I mean, like, God's going like, I know what I'll do. I'll get an angel to stir the water, and let's see how many of these, you know, handicapped folks can get into the water first, right? And so you imagine, like, again, this is, this doesn't seem like the heart of God our Father. And then there's just the practical principle that, again, this is illumin like highlighting an angel and saying that here's, there's some magic water here at the, this part of the temple and miracles, while they bring deliverance, are prayed for by God's people, we can go to the Lord requesting them. The point of miracles is to bring glory to God, is to bring glory to God. And so this is all the framework why we're not going to go more into trying to dissect uh, uh, second part of three, uh, verse three and verse four, depending on what scripture you have. So here's what it says going on to verse five. One man was there who had been disabled for 38 years, 38 years. Pause for a moment. I'm 42. Can you imagine, uh, for me, going like since the time I was four, I've been having this struggle, this disability. Uh, let's not gloss over the human element in Scripture. This man had made, figured out a way to make his dysfunction function for him. Right? It's like that his purpose when he got up in the morning was to try to find an answer, a solution, and I th found it in this pool in by the temple, and if it gets stirred up on the right day at the right time, and I got, and, you know, my 40 time is, is going well, you know, it's like I can get in there and shove something. Can you imagine the scene? Again, paralyzed, hurting, lame people, shoving one another to try to get into this pool, all for the goodness and glory of what God can do in them and through them. Again, this superstition of the day, he had been disabled for 38 years, and this was not, I don't believe, God's will. Um, he was desperate, he was seeking, and though he was at the right place seeking, he was not seeking the right thing, Right? He was trying to find an answer in a superstition and a tradition and something that someone told me would work over at that church because they have the right worship, the right Bible version, the pastor wears the right clothes, the people are about the right things, and if I could just be around that, then I'll be good, right? So verse 5, it says, one, one man was there, again, who had been disabled for 38 years. Verse 6 says, when Jesus saw him lying there, and realized that he had already been there for a long time, what did he say to him? He said, do you want to get well? Don't you love Jesus? Always asking a question, All right? I mean, that's just Jesus. The answer, always asking a question to people. And the man obviously didn't know who Jesus was for whatever reason. He said, sir, um, I, have, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up, but while I'm coming, someone goes down ahead of me. And again, I just love the heart, tenderness, goodness of Jesus that he doesn't even address the pool, he doesn't address the angel, he doesn't address the water. He simply says, get up, pick up your, your mat, and walk. And then instantly the man got well, picked up his mat, and started to walk. So what, let's, let's pause right there. Some facts uh, about this miracle. Number one, which I think is, is important, is that this is not a faith healing. The man did not have faith. He did not know who Jesus was, right? We, we look around Scripture, uh, certainly in the Gospels. You can look uh, several instances in Matthew 8 and 9. You could see the faith of a centurion that would heal his servant. You would see the woman in chapter, Matthew chapter 9 with the issue of blood, that if I could just grab the hem of his garment, I will be well. Uh, you could see the father, the synagogue leader that came to Jesus saying, Jesus, you can heal my child. Uh, you can heal my daughter. Do it. And so Jesus while he's in the crowd, the woman grabs his garment, the little girl dies, Jesus goes and heals her, you know, you know, resurrects her from the dead. And so there are people that put their faith. And even with the, the centurion, Jesus said, I have not seen faith like this in Israel. And here comes this man who doesn't know Jesus. Jesus asks him a question. Hey, do you want to be well? He doesn't even say, of course, I want to be well. He goes right to like, well, I can't be. I can't be. 
So it's not a faith healing, right? And then the second thing I, I want us to notice is that it's, it's a free healing, right? Uh, Jesus asks questions. He gets the wrong response. But he responds as Lord because it's who he is, the goodness of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Aren't we glad that when he asks the question, even if I don't have the right answer, he is the right answer, right? That despite what is going on, in his goodness, his grace, and his mercy, he still addresses what is going on in my life. So it's a free healing. And then what I love, too, just a, a practical, it, it's a full healing. His words are enough. No pool, no, you know, no race to the water, to the deep end. If you cannonball into the pool the right way, then you'll be okay. No, none of that. It, it, it's full that instantly um, he, when he speaks, it, it is finished, it is complete. And I, I want to encourage some of us today. I know, obviously, there's a lot of different age and backgrounds and just all, all, there's a unique group here in this uh, space. We all have need. You may be praying for that sick family member, that wayward child. You may have gotten a diagnosis. It may seem grim. It may seem dark. You may not know what to do. But when he heals, it's full because Jesus' word is enough. It is enough. The man didn't need rehab. He didn't have to go after God healed him and go, okay, now go see this guy for six months, work with the band on, you know, like pulling, make sure your back is stretched out, sleep on a wood board. It didn't require prep for an operation. Jesus is Lord and he rules over sickness. Jesus is Lord and he will rule over your dysfunction and my dysfunction and the thing you got used to your life. When Jesus shows up to the scene, he, he changes that, right? He changes that. And so it's a full healing. And so in this passage, we see Jesus breaking the mold for all kinds of uh, unhealthy forms of thinking. What do I mean by that? All right, so when we look at the man that was by the pool, he's saying, if I could just be by the pool, if I can just do the right thing, then God may bless me, right? This creeps into our thinking all the time. The longer you serve the Lord, I think the greater the temptation is to start thinking that he may be less good and you're just a little good. Right. The day. Think about the day that you came to Jesus. We were so aware of our sin and our brokenness that we're going, I cannot do this on my own. And the minute that God starts working in your life, we get our life straight. Now we're coming to men's Bible study at 645 in the morning. I'm going to work fired up. All of a sudden, his goodness may come down a little bit. And I'm kind of OK. I'm kind of good. Right. I'm kind of doing all right. I'm doing the right things. And if I do, he'll bless me. If I walk closely with the Lord, then the bad thing won't happen. Then the sickness won't get me. Then the cancer will go away. And again, Jesus breaks the mold for this, not because the guy said the right thing, but he didn't have a clue who he was. And Jesus was still good. He was still good. If I can just get into the pool. All right. So we see it was a free healing. It was a full healing. Uh, just some points. All right. That, that I want us our, our big takeaway. Three things really quickly that I want us to take away from this is that Jesus is Lord of what we can't control. Jesus is Lord of what we can't control. What do I mean by that? Sickness. We obviously can't control that. None of us would choose to have an, you know, our loved ones, ourselves, friends to have illness. Our circumstances, right? Our bodies. What's going to happen in life? Our kids, right? Some of us are, age, are of age where our kids are adults. They're in marriages. And man, that could be such a, a roller coaster ride. I have my oldest who's 17 years old and you know, he's, he's, he has a little girlfriend, and I think, like, I've never felt, been more aware of my lack of control over anything than having three teenagers in my life. I used to think, it's like, I'm, gonna ju I'm a parent just perfectly so that I could feel like I got it all together. That lasted about four years, right? It's like the minute they can run, it's like they were running from me. And then I was, you know, until they were there. But Jesus is Lord of what we can't control. Here's what it says in, 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 in verse 5. Let's, let's hop back into it. It says, now... That day was the Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, this is the Sabbath. The law prohibits you from picking up your mat. So just remember, there were laws about the Sabbath, obviously, that the Lord gave. Um, but as far as you not being able to pick up a mat, that was not a law. What that was was a tradition, was some, some extras, right? Like some add-ons, like the, the religious leaders, people that were teachers of the law had said, hey, here's what it means to not work. And so... Their focus for the Pharisees, Jesus heals someone, and they're worried about where he put, why were you carrying your sleeping bag? Where are you going with that sleeping bag, buddy? You know, it's like, we're not supposed to do that today. What does that show us is that the focus, their focus, oftentimes for us, our focus reveals our heart. Our focus will reveal our heart, good and bad. 
right? It's like when our focus is Jesus, when our, whatever comes, whatever we're putting on, you know, our, our heart, our time, our attention to, and we begin to see that in our marriage, in our parenting, at our workplace, with our neighbors, with our friends, and with our, in our friends in, in tough circumstances. But when the focus becomes anything else, it all is out of alignment. And so uh, he replied, he, so they asked him, you know, told them, hey, the law prohibits you from picking up your mat. And I love this. This kind of is a throwback to me when I read this, like Adam, when God says, like, you know, did you do this? And he goes, well, God, it was this woman that you gave me. You know, this is the one that, you know, actually did it. So what did the man say? He's like, well, the man who, who made me well told me pick up your mat and walk, right? So even now his focus wasn't on the delivery uh, or God delivering him from 38 years of being paralyzed, being, uh, you know, unable to move, to being sick, to living like a life without purpose. Now it wasn't about the freedom that Jesus gave. Now it was about, well, how do I fall into the system and look good or, or, or fall under alignment to be to look like I'm right, even if I'm not right. That took about what, you know, like half the day, a couple of hours till the Pharisees came to him and told him that all of a sudden it wasn't about freedom anymore. So he replied that he the one who may be well told me, pick up your man and walk. And so they said, who is the man who told you pick up your man and walk? They asked. But the man who was healed did not know who it was because Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. And so, of course, Jesus, after this, found him in the temple and said to him, just a side note there, it is really important, Jesus is modeling follow-up ministry, right? It's like something happens in church, we got to make that call, we got to make that visit, we got to follow up with people. So Jesus wasn't like, on to the next town. He goes, I got to go find that guy, right? And so he follows up with him, and he says, see, you are well. Do not sin anymore so that something worse doesn't happen to you, doesn't happen to you. And so what we know, right, is that not all sickness is because of sin, but the implication there is going is that you were in this position because of some behavior, not only just because of maybe what you had done, but ultimately, right, what is the, where does sin lead us to? To death, right? And so that is the wage of sin, as it tells us in Romans. So he's saying, hey, if you continue, something worse is going to happen to you, which, is, you know, may not just be that you get sick, but is the eternal destination of your soul of being apart from the Lord. And so verse 15 says, the man went and reported to the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. Therefore, the Jews, again, here's what we talked about at the beginning, began persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. Jesus shows up on the scene. He asks the question, the wrong answer, with no faith is given. Jesus is still good, still does a miracle, as he does often in your life and in my life, that in my misery, in my pain, when I didn't know left from right, he still shows up and is good. He goes back to the man and says, hey, make sure now that you're not continuing in sin. The man, in fear of perhaps maybe just uh, being kicked out from the temple, in fear of not aligning to the religious leaders or structures at the time, says, well, that guy did it. He told me to do it. That's why I picked it up. They go, and now they begin, like I said, like it went from Jesus the miracle worker, Jesus the winemaker, Jesus the, the man who is welcoming all, to all of a sudden, Jesus the lawbreaker. And here's where we're going to find the, ch the tension for us. The Pharisees, they were just privy to a miracle, yet their focus was what, on what was threatened. Their rules and their systems created a false assurance. A false assurance. Their framework placed people at the bottom, right? That when it was about, uh, you know, a, a preserving the structure that had in place, God was not first, the system was first. People were not second. It's like the system was first and second. And so these things easily creep into our lives without us knowing it, right? Have you ever been at a place where you, so I love our church, right? We are a church for people from all walks of life. And what that means is that folks from all kind of different, you know, backgrounds, faith traditions, unchurch, de church, wherever you're at, we want to build a bridge so that you would know who Jesus is, that you would hear the gospel, that your life would be transformed. And so people walk into our space and we may think, well, that's different. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, well, why, why would they do that? And we have to guard ourselves because, again, we, we, we fall, we can fall easily in danger of being like a Pharisee. See, when I was young, again, I, I grew up in church. Maybe you did, too. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you're just new to this thing. So it doesn't matter. We're, we're here, brothers in the Lord, seeking to do his will and honor him. But when I was young, I would have easily said, right, because sometimes we try to find ourselves in the story, and I'm not saying, the, the Bible is not saying that it's about me, and I'm like Jesus, but going, God, what, what, how do I take some nuggets of truth? Who, 
where would I have been in this? When I was younger, easily I would say, I'm like one of the disciples going, you know, saying, go get them, Jesus. Those Pharisees are talking trash. Go, go handle them, Jesus. And I would have been amening and all those things, and let's move forward. As I got older, I started seeing myself as the broken man, the, si the guy that was sick, that didn't have the answers, that didn't know what the right thing to do was. Now, having served and followed the Lord for as many years as I've had the privilege of doing, it's more clear to me that I tend to lean Pharisee. Why, who do you think you are, Jesus, asserting your authority that way? That doesn't fit with what I know, understand, believe. And I, I, I mean, hear me, brothers. I'm not telling us that we are going to stray away from Scripture, man. This is our anchor, our foundation, man. We are faithful to the Word. It is, you know, infallible, perfect, reveals God's will, His heart His, uh, for, for us. But it's more easy for me to find my place, in, find myself in the place of saying, well, is Jesus Lord or something else that, that I've you know, established in my mind? So again, we said that Jesus is Lord of what we can control. Here's my second point. Jesus is Lord of what we are responsible for. What do I mean by that? Is that what is of first and most importance? He's Lord of that, right? And so what should be first for all of us, right? We know, our, again, it's that vertical relationship, relationship with the Lord. That's the one, right? Then we start looking at our family. And, and for most of us here, I would imagine, though we may struggle, though we have challenges, I don't know where you're at today, uh, you know, most of us would say, well, Felix, like, you know, I love my family and I want to, you know, love my wife and raise a godly family, my kids, and have a great career and leave this godly legacy. And all of a sudden, the good things begin to fight with the best thing, which is the Lord, for what is Lord in our life. So now, is my family Lord? Is my name in the community Lord? Is the system and structure and things that I've worked most of my life for, is that Lord? Because if it is Lord, it's not that that's a bad thing, but it will be a cruel master, and it is no way as good, can be as good as Jesus being Lord. It will overpromise and underdeliver every single time. But God in his goodness says, hey, you are responsible to lead. You are responsible for your family. You are responsible for, for these things. And so what is the first and most important? We've had this sacred assembly time over the last couple of weeks, and we're saying, hey, put God first. Put God first. That's not a church thing. We didn't, you know, come up, meet the leaders, meet and go, you know what would be a good thing is if we put God first. No, it is his will for our lives, for your life, for us as his church. And so he is Lord of what we're responsible for. My family, my kids, my career, my finances, all of it. He is Lord. What will be our focus today? How we steward our time. Again, all these things God said, I entrust you to steward that, right? With the Pharisees, again, the religious leaders, they weren't bad because they were religious leaders. They were bad is because they made the law Lord. And the law, obviously, was given by God, showed us how to live in accordance with God, and again, showed them at the time that you cannot do this aside from God's help in sending his son Jesus. But what they did is they, hey, we're going to add all these other things to what the law says. Miss the heart and spirit of the law and make it about you not being able to carry a sleeping bag, even though God is clearly working amongst his people. Right. And so if, if we insert again for me and maybe you're better than me, I hope you are. That's my prayer is that as we insert ourselves or try to find, Lord, who, who can I relate to? What, what are you showing me about me? Is that, man, I tend to lean Pharisee. And maybe you do, too. The Sabbath was giving to, given to be a blessing, not a weight. Jesus confirms that in Mark 2. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the Pharisees missed the heart and freedom of what God was given them. So. Jesus is Lord of what we can't control, and he is Lord of what we're also uh, uh, responsible for, what he calls us to steward. Here's what it says in verse 17. Jesus responded to them, my father is still working. Um, he said, my father is still working, and I am working also. This is why the Jews began, remember we talked about this at the beginning, began trying all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, and making himself equal to God. The Pharisees, their tradition, their customs, that was the Lord, and they settled for a lesser God. But here comes Jesus all of a sudden asserting himself. Remember, we, we'll wear the t-shirt, the hat, the sticker, Jesus is Lord. 
But what happens when, he's, when we love the crucified Jesus, the miracle-working Jesus, that's the same Jesus that said, yeah, that part of your mind, that part of your time, those secret things you do, the secret things you say, the place where maybe insecurity, fear, doubt, whatever it is, I want to rule there too. Do we tend to lean a little bit more like, no, no, don't, don't touch that, Jesus. We're good, Jesus. Do the good things. Be the good Jesus just that, that, that does X, Y, and Z. But don't be the Jesus that is equal to God, the Father that says that I'm not only Savior, but I came to rule and reign in your heart and life. And so my third point is less of a point and less of more of a question. And my question to you is, is Jesus Lord? He is Lord. Jesus is Lord over what we can't control. Jesus is Lord over what I'm responsible for. And just my third point is Jesus Lord for you today, here, and now. I'm just wrap up with this. Um, again, we, we don't say any of this in judgment. Jesus, in his goodness, begins to, be, to, to do all the things that he sees the Father doing. And the people at the time, some folks loved it, loved what he was doing, found freedom in this. And then the same folks that were supposed to know more about the Lord, there's a high, you know, we're, we're, we're repelled by Jesus. We're thinking this man is sinning. He's making himself equal with God. And that mistake could have been made because it was their job as the religious leaders to, what is someone doing? We're hearing something we've never heard before, but Jesus did signs, he did wonders, he did miracles, he, he shared, he preached, he lived it out, he demonstrated it. And though they were in the right place, they still missed the right thing. And so that's my caution for us today, is that, that he's Lord in your marriage, with your kids, your business, the good times, the bad times, your, your, you know, secret thoughts, your idle words, your idle actions. He desires to rule in all of that space. And Jesus will not be second. He will not relent. He will not be less so that I can be more. He won't. He's Lord. He won't settle for any other title. He's not going like, well, I, I make a really good advisor, Felix. You should try my services out. You know, it's like, I will advise you well. I promise. No, no. He's Lord. He's Lord. And it's for his glory and ultimately our good. Let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, <clears throat> this morning, Lord, as we opened your word and see uh, what you did long ago in your ministry here on earth, God, we wrestle with the tension, Lord, that, that you said hard things then, Lord, that now, Lord, thousands of years later, Lord, can be a lot easier to just say and wrap our minds around because we have the the benefit of time, and yet, Jesus, the human condition is such that we will fight over lordship, that we will seek to give you some, if not most, of our heart, Lord, and withhold, Lord, what we are fearful of, what we are distrusting of, Lord, what we think that we need to handle on our own. And Jesus, I, I just pray against that thought, Lord, that fear, that doubt, Lord. I pray against, well, even with the enemy, the lies of the enemy, Lord Jesus, that would have us believe that you are not a good Lord and a good Savior, and that we somehow need to close the gap on what you cannot do. God, today, as, as, as sons, Father, as brothers here, Lord, we, we pray and ask Jesus that you guide us, Lord, that all over our lives today, moving forward from our time, our affection, our resources, our talent, Lord, our, the focus of our thoughts, that you would reign in those places, God, and that what would come out as a result is, Lord, a, a legacy and fruit that points people again back to your goodness lord thank thank you so much that it wasn't based on our tradition how long we've been in church reading the right bible coming from the right family or the right side of town it is solely the goodness of jesus and, and so today lord we we ask god that we would put our hope faith and confidence in that again and lord whatever area or space we may be wrestling with god may we bring it to the foot of the cross lord and find freedom find hope, find deliverance there. We love you, we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen and amen. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of your day.